individual uh, talks and uh, uh, actually uh, considering incredibly coherent. Uh, it's really hard to do uh, in a round table. I don't mean each individual talk, I mean collectively. <laughs> <laughs> well, only one or two were personally coherent. Uh, <laughs> on a serious note, they really worked well together. And now it's time for you to ask uh, your questions and I'll just deliver the mic when you need it. Yes. Why don't you say to state your name? Out of everybody wants to see a little bit of a performance right here. Hi, um, I'm Caitlin Carter. I'm a PhD candidate at Princeton. I really, really enjoyed this panel, all of the papers, and it called to mind a lot of issues I've been dealing with recently and thinking about. And my main question has to do maybe with terminology. Um, I was sort of interested what you would all have to say about the relationship between transparency, publicity, performativity, spectacle, um, just the relationship between these. Because it strikes me that a couple of the papers seem to be talking about transparency as sort of being thought of as a way to sort of a tool to guarantee authenticity, but then it doesn't work because of the ways transparency is sort of enacted. Um, which is inherently performative, um, it seems. I, I don't know if that's making too much sense, but sort of the way, what, what does transparency actually mean in practice? And it seems like, uh, Laura Mason, you're talking about these trials, which end up not actually ensuring very much transparency because they're performative. Um, uh, if, if I, I mean, I don't think that, I don't think that it's because they're performative because I think that revolutionaries, that the revolutionary ideal of transparency is that, um, that, that transparency can be, um, transparency can be performed in public or in court, but that if I'm performing transparency, we will all resonate together in a sense. I will, I will sort of speak the truth and you will hear me speaking the truth but that I think that what how revolutionaries understand that idea of transparency to be violated is because they see the convention and then the directory staging trials and so I think the tension is not between transparency and performance but between um, transparency and performance on the one hand and staging on the other hand I mean, that's how I would sort of summarize it. You know, um, one of the, the sources that we kind of used in framing this particular panel was William Eggington's book on how the world became a stage, presence, theatricality, and the question of modernity. And he basically argues that one of the shifts that happens as we move from the medieval to, to the modern, early modern period, is that people become much more aware of themselves as performing, that, that sort of the world becomes a theater. So if you look at the, the court, for example, or and, and, you know, that, that certainly um, transparency is something that's performed as much as anything else. I mean, that, that, but it's, and there's an awareness, but not an awareness, and it, it becomes very complicated. It does become circular in this way that you were sort of suggesting, but, but it does seem, and that's one of the things I think that all of these, these uh, papers sort of touch on, is this, this awareness of, of that we are all sort of performing for a public of various kinds, but it seems like in the case of the trials, it's the manipulated mm -hmm. nature mm -hmm. of those mm -hmm. trials that becomes problematic. It's not the performance as such, it's the manipulation almost. So. Right, right. It's a sort of short circuiting of the right. performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also, this was a question I forgot to raise because I got so obsessed with the Judith Butler thing. Um, is, but, but one of the questions to, to think about too in terms of this issue of transparency is does it also represent a new form of surveillance? You know, we, we tend to think of transparency as this un, bearing, unmasking, but there is a way in which it then can transform into surveillance and represent its own form of disciplining. And, and uh, one thing I want to say in terms of I mean, because I threw in this term is there's the performative, but performativity is something somewhat different because it's something that becomes in internalized and actually one would say moves from the conscious to the subconscious as well. I'm Whitney Walton. Thank you so much for such a um, 
a provocative presentation. So my question is really directed at Christine, but anyone else can talk, because it's about gender, because really, you're the only one talking about women in this, at least explicitly. And so I guess I'm, I'm intrigued by what you were saying about, um, um, is it Gundel? Yeah, Stephen Gundel. Gundel, yeah. Gundel talking about celebrity starting with Napoleon, and of course, yeah. you know, so he's this big self-promoter. But your celebrities were women, right? And um, and yet, you know, as you've mentioned before, you know, celebrities are are people who they don't really accomplish anything, right. but they're just famous, right? So I I, I hate to draw the conclusion that women just don't do anything so they're celebrities. So can you just talk about that please? Sure. I mean, it's, it's, yes. Stephen Gundel is, he more focuses on glamour and Fred Inglis is the one who talks okay. about, about celebrity as something that, that's not really earned, that it's just the mere fact that you're popular, popularly acknowledged, therefore you become famous. And, and with these women, I mean, it's I think more problematic than that because there's this kind of split because the reason that the public is very interested in them is because they do sort of parade themselves out in public that they wear these new fashions. People are very interested in the very revealing clothes that they wear. Um, Mercier writes about them, but also the newspapers write about them in various ways. But also, you know, women like Therese Italian are quite politically connected. I mean, her she she sets up a salon at her home with her husband. Then she becomes the, the mistress quite publicly of, of uh, Paul Barras. And so she's very connected in directory society as well and is seen as somebody who tries to bring together some of the disparate forces in, in directory society and sort of create peace. And so, so these women, and, and Juliette Racamier, I believe, as well, I haven't studied the other women as much, and so I'd like, I'm, I'm interested in that. But one of the things that is interesting about them is that we tend to focus on them as glamorous, as celebrities, but there's something else going on there. But I'm... I suspect that one of the things that gives them entree into that world of political power is their glamour and celebrity. And so I've been looking at, at beauty over the last couple of years. I'm sort of interested in beauty as, as social capital and as political capital and, and those links. But I haven't, as I said, it's more suggestive at this point than fully fleshed out. And that's why I'm really interested in, in looking more at these women because I think that we tend to dismiss the political influence of these women and focus on their, their, their glamour and their, their presence. But I think that there's other things going on. The Kardashians, I think not. But anyway. <laughs> can, I, can I add something to yeah. that? I mean, I think that what's interesting about someone like um, Madame Tellien is that, um, that her friends may say that she has glamour, but her enemies say that she has power. And we could That's say the same thing right. about, we could yeah. say the same yep. thing about women in the old regime. That's right. As well. well, and, and the, the, the book that I'm currently working on with, with Tracy is on <coughs> royal mistresses. And it seems that with mistresses, the very public part of their, their performance is that they're the mistresses. They, they sleep with the king, that they, they sort of perform this role at the court. The secret part is that they're also the king's political advisor and, and the one that he goes to turns to. And that there is this close connection between sort of the secrecy of the French state and the sort of secret role that individuals like mistresses play. Because you cannot publicly state that this woman has this, this kind of political influence. And yet that's a very important part of their role. And so, anyway. So, so it's, it's, I'm having a lot of fun messing around with this, but I, my ideas are half-baked at the moment. Mm -hmm. and so. well, let, me, let me ask you a follow-up, sort of. Uh, the one thing I'm hearing is that there is no early modern, modern, uh, uh, you know, it's one way and then it changes to the other way. It sounds like it's ebbing and flowing at a very rapid rate. It, apl it applies to individuals and societies. I'm struggling with, you know, rites and rituals to closed door confessions. I'm trying to think about Catholicism and how it reorients itself around, you know, confessing your sins. I mean, do you have a sense that there's actually an early modern version of this and then a modern version and then a post-Freudian version? That's the way I might. No, I mean, it's really important because when, with Freud, your motivations are shielded even to yourself. You don't really know. So I wonder if you have any thought to, is there, his, is there a, is there just, is this episodic or is this, uh, is there a, fa are there phases of this? So it's an easy question. Well, um. <laughs> <laughs> well I, from my work, I, I do think yeah. that the one thing in the 18th century, I mean, there, there, you know, the public displays of confessions, like you, you, even 16th and 17th, well, the 17th century, because the confession really becomes a closed thing at the, in the early 17th century. Um, 
Um, and so you have to, sort of the public kind of procession of going to confession is seen as a mark of your virtue. But what's, what I do think is different in the 18th century is that there just seemed to be this moment when there's a kind of confessing to the public and, and absolution by the public. In the as revolutionary a, era? No, the I'm, talking about, I'm talking about the 18th century. So I'm, talking, I'm actually talking about, believe it or not, the 1730s and 40s and 50s. Because, and precise, I, I, in, in that period too, is because there is there's so much antagonism um, around the clergy, around the Jesuits, and Jesuits as confessors too. I mean, I think that's that's a central part of it is that the Jesuit identity as confessor bring brings this to the fore as well. And so, and and yet, I, I do think that that you know these are still people of faith, um, and that they have to have their faith affirmed. So, it, and and um, and and particularly with the pol pol um, polemics. Um, generated by, by the Nouvelles Ecclesiastiques, there's a turning away from the clergy and this constant appeal to the public. Okay, So laying it out before the public, presenting to the public. So that would be one kind of change. I, I, let me, I, I, what I would say is that, that the, the performance continues. That I, I, going back to this idea, that I think that, that mm -hmm. from the, from the, the period of the Renaissance, sort of the shift from the medieval to the modern world, that there is this awareness of, of performance, that, that you are performing for an audience. What changes, perhaps, is the content of that performance over time, that, that you know, in the court of Louis XIV, people are much more comfortable with artificiality. In the 18th century, suddenly, um, it's, you have to, to perform in a natural way. It's a heck of a lot easier to, to slap makeup and lots of elaborate clothes on yourself and be beautiful than it is when you have to perform in a natural way and make it look like you just have woken up that way. But, um, but you're still performing mm -hmm. in a sense. It's just like I said, the content and what you perform yeah. changes. But I think that, that that awareness that you are acting for an audience goes on. I'm curious what Jim has to say. Yeah. Because of yes, it's the, your everyday life. So. Yeah, the everyday right. life. I, th I, well, I was suggesting I think that the performance of everyday life is very much bound up with hierarchy and it's bound up with the sense, rightly or wrongly, that, pe that people are always watching and people are always judging. And, and I think that um, the, the, the psychology of that is different in a, a polity that calls itself egalitarian, whether it is or not. It doesn't mean that the performance stops. We know, uh, we know this from reading Tocqueville for example, that, there, that, that equality has its own set of expectations, but it's different, I think, at that point. Um, and we tell ourselves um, in the modern era that, that, um, that we're not acting on bad faith, but, uh, but either whether it's post-Freud or, or whether it's uh, uh, existentialist critiques, there are, there, are, there are reasons for which we might doubt that also. But it, the dynamic, I think, is very different. Which one of you? Oh, hi, I'm uh, Claire Croston. Um, just following up on these themes, and again about the masking, one of the things that I have been confused about in thinking about this lately and working with a student is the, the, the critique not not necessarily like in La Rochefoucauld and in the court of Louis XIV, but the critique over the 18th century of the masking and the artificiality is seems to be directed at women so strongly, and the, the gendered critiques of makeup being a big symbol of this artificiality, mostly worn by women, and that women kind of bear this stigma in the critique of Rousseau and others of, of being the artificial ones. And so the question I'm thinking about the revolutionary discourse of unmasking and transparency and how, what happens when you move from it's women who bear this stigma, who are mostly the problem, who, are the f who bear the shame of fakeness um, and making society fake to a revolutionary context in which it's men who now have a problem with being fake and can't be fake anymore. And I, I'm just curious about how that transition takes place and how there's like a re, perhaps a regendering mm -hmm. of artificiality and sincerity, and, and not necessarily why, but how that mm -hmm. happens. If you see what I mean. Well, I think that um, I think that the shift that comes with the revolution <coughs> is not explicitly gender-based, but it has gender implications. 
revolutionaries, you will know, banned masks in 1790, first the municipality and later it, um, it was made national. Um, and I think that um, the, 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 the reason given was that aristocrats can hide their faces, so if we have no masks, then we'll be able to recognize them. But it very quickly began uh, to say that um, people with covered faces, uh, you know, people with uncovered faces also have uncovered hearts. And so it becomes psychological. And I think that when it becomes psychological, it's self-feeding. Transparency is self-feeding with conspiracy. And even if there's a spectacle, Laura, that can... That, can, that, that is a genuine spectacle of transparency, which really can only happen if the people themselves are part of the performance rather than watching a performance. Still, what is each individual thinking? And, and so I think that that implicates everyone, men and women alike. Maybe Jennifer's stuff on, on conscription with mm. the... Yeah, I was reflecting on the, the sort of question of, of continuity, because... Certainly, you you see that in, in many things. I've seen even like popular theater. You reprise a lot of the same plots, characters over very different periods. Um, but I, what I was looking at a bit was actually not so much a rupture in terms of everyday performativity, but in the political use of spectacle and the ways in which you imagine spectacle is going to have certain effects on the people witnessing it. Oh, uh, and that's what I've been trying to work out, or, at least in this context, is the extent to which that that is being rethought in the later revolution. Colin Jones, um, University of London, uh, Queen Mary University of London. I was just we're really interested in what uh, Laura was saying about this shift from the sort of transparent to then, you know, suddenly political trial. But I'm trying to t track it down. I mean, who is feeling this? Is this, this us as historians looking back? Or is there a sort of transitional moment where I mean, I'm saying this in the context of, you know, like when you look at things back, like the Danton trial, you think, mm -hmm. oh my God, it's such a show trial. And yet, when you read what people are saying about what people are saying in Paris, they're saying, oh Danton, I never imagined that. You know, he's a terrible bloke. You know, so I, I just, I just wonder, is it are we like visiting these categories on the past? And can I'd like follow up, but I'll give, but. It's different, so even... Yeah, well, I, I mean, is it, I would say that it comes, it dates from the Hébert trial, that with Hébert, you see a real sort of division in opinion, and that the, that the, that the police reports are, are increasingly reporting people saying, you know, how could the government do that to Hébert? Um, and, <coughs> and then a sort of growing disillusion, and I think it kind of traces also the the widening public political divisions that it's that as it becomes possible for there to be a left and a right um, people take distance from conspiracy charges of people they identify with politically so under the directory um, the Democrats say well the, the Babo from the equals didn't conspire. They say they didn't conspire. At this, and then when the the Protier conspiracy, the Royalist conspiracy, is revealed, the right kind of laugh it off, and they say, oh, "This is just the government um, sort of making this up to 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 target us." So I think that it dates from Hébert, and it kind of and there is this kind of growing cynicism, and that's only in Paris, but it's a start. So. Actually, what I was thinking with Hébert was the other <laughs> point, which was often made, which was. Uh, Hebert, they all say about, God, you know, we all thought you were so great, and he, he's like a little sniveling woman, because he <laughs> goes through the trial incredibly, uh, mm -hmm. you know, pathetically screaming and sobbing and sniveling and everything like that. So I think that sort of played yeah. into mm. the female thing about her. But actually, of course, and here, I, you know, <laughs> can I just carry on and just say, you know, I never, ever advertise my own books, but just gonna, I'm going to make this an exception this night. But in my book uh, on the Smiler, Smiler Revolution, one of the things that's really interested me was that it's not just about trials, it's about the execution and the guillotining. Mm. And one of the things which is really striking, although I, I sort of argue in that, is that the women who go to the trial, to, to execution, go with a smile on their face in this incredibly stoical, uh, stoical way. So actually perform mm -hmm. a 
on, you know, you could say, oh, it's performance, you know, it's all the rest of it, but actually what's coming across and what people pick up is an incredible sincerity and an incredible uh, 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 value. So there's a sort of really, uh, transparency is being used, if you like, or is coming out of it against the, uh, against the state, which is making such a point about transparency. But I think there's also a script for how to die, how to go to the scaffold <laughs> properly and be executed that dates far back into the old regime as well, that those women are following. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With, with a smile on the face, though, that's quite important. Yeah. <laughs> My book, anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, we won't, we won't, you wouldn't mention it. Afterwards. <laughs> no, no, we can't help but smiling. Uh, Hey, um, Meta Harder, Suni Onyanta, thank you so much for this, this great session. It was such a great end to the day. Um, I really was interested in um, what was being said about um, the rejection of the theater of everyday life um, in the revolution and the rejection of masks and, uh, and, and, and all that. But it also made me think that in many ways, isn't it the people who um, who wear masks or who wore masks and isn't it the sort of shapeshifters who actually survived the revolution so that the actors and and I think um, someone like uh, Monsieur Italien is actually an example of that and I think he can be equally accused of many of the things that Madame Italien is accused of so I, I wondered what you thought of that and, and why that is. I mean, if the revolution is so obsessed with, um, with transparency, um, well, why do the people who are actually not transparent, why do they make it? How do they make it? <laughs> Thank you. I don't mean this in a flippant way, but um, they were better at it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, 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 were, they, were, they were two steps ahead rather than only one step ahead, as were the others who were wearing masks. You, I mean, you, you could say, I suppose. I think it's interesting that when Robespierre falls, the rhetoric around that is that he wears a mask of patriotism. The, 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 the very word is there, and it's, it so proliferate, pr proliferates during the terror. It's, um, if the goal is transparency, there will only be masks, more and more and more masks. But I think these were the lucky ones. And I think that's right. And I think that, that just because somebody is, is performing and, and they, they're aware of themselves performing, it doesn't mean that others don't interpret that as sincerity. Or they mm -hmm. don't, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, Chalion is a good example. He mm -hmm. manages to become, you know, a Thermidorian at just the precisely correct mm -hmm. moment and, you know, brandishes his knife or whatever it is he, he, he that, 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 um, that his, his, his lover sent to him. And so, so I think that, yeah, I think that the people who are better at this are able to convince people that they are in fact sincere in their, mm -hmm. in their conversions or that they were always on that side of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at our own political scene today and, and that we have political candidates who manage to convince the world that they're a man of the people and speak for them. And so. I was it, wondering whether that was going to happen. Whole <laughs> 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 session without mentioning but, uh, Donald Trump. But anyway, just just one other point, though. But so. I don't I don't think we have to say that this is a cynical view. No. Because it goes back, Jack, to your point that how we experience the world. I'm sure they were deeply convinced that sure. they that they were sincere. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Julia Osman, Mississippi State University. Um, this has been a fantastic panel. Thank you so much. You've given me so much to think of. And right now what I'm thinking of is what we've just been talking about with masks and what Mita was saying earlier about kind of these external things you do kind of infect the way you feel eternally, internally. And so I, might, I have this very general question kind of about this artificiality, these masks and sincerity and transparency, which is if you're wearing a mask and you wear it so convincingly that you become your mask, do you then have to come up with a new mask, so to speak? I mean, are you constantly having to reinvent um, your, your, your performance, heaven forbid it actually becomes genuine, if that makes sense? I, I don't know about, I, I would say repetition is really maybe more important than a new mask, but it has to be repeated, it has to be reaffirmed it has to be renewed and yeah. reaffirmed, and and then the question is: Does is is, is through that process of re, um, reaffirmation, does it subtly alter because the circumstances around you are altering? You know, so it's not a kind of 
take one off, put another one on, but really a kind of subtle morphing that's perhaps coming from within, but also external as well. Okay, well, I, I can't resist this. Well, I know I had already one question, but how do we get this far and not talk about David? I mean, he, I just don't understand. I don't begin to understand how that, we made it that far. I mean, it just strikes me, we ha you have to talk about what was his special magic at it. What, why, why did the revolutionaries, uh, you know, really buy it? Why did the public buy it? I mean, MRI is the, I think, in my mind, maybe the mountain is the pinnacle, sorry. Uh, maybe the mountain is the pinnacle, but I think, I think the, the painting uh, by David is, the, is, the, is an extraordinary effort at, you know, trying to communicate the reality in symbolic form. I mean, it's ultimately a deception, I mean, in, in a lot of ways. So, uh, what do you think about, what's Marat's role in your, in your theory? I mean, I mean, not Marat's role, David's role. David's role, yeah. yeah. I think that's, well, part of what I was alluding to was how different in looking at the sort of institution of conscription and dealing with a particular case of the Rostat martyrs, um, that sort of decision to display was. I mean, there's no, there's no equivalent to you know, imagery of them as you know displaying their wounds as prominently. Now that's a question of sort of not of David's role necessarily, but of kind of what is imagined the effects of the, the subject that's being displayed. There's a reason no one's mentioned it. Yeah. Yeah. In the sense too, right? Because we're being really transparent, but we need co national costume. No, right. right. You yeah. Tape here. It's not worth hearing. I mean, it is a yeah, it's right. always worth hearing. No, just to add to the David and give you some more time to come up with an answer on <laughs> David. Uh, but the, the, the project for the national costumes is so interesting because if we're transparent and we're not wearing masks anymore, we need theatrical costumes in order to display our Frenchness and, and sort of interesting anyway in the context of uh, what you're saying and also uh, what Jeff was telling us about the sites of theater, mm -hmm. yeah. the way that the overt theatricality of costumes is brought in uh, first uh, with David uh, and then again in, in the directory, I mean there are two moments, right, of two very different political moments where national costume becomes well, an issue. Well, the cocard, not as a full-fledged costume uh -huh. necessarily, but as a, as a marker of national identity uh -huh. that, that you know, an attempt to kind of visualize a nation here. Yeah. But you have to dress up as yeah. a sincere patriot, which seems weird. Mm. I, I would just say that, that David, I mean, I would say that the, if, you, if, if you have a spectrum and the mask is at one end, on the other hand, it's not the costume, but the uniform. And, and if you think about yeah. the dress as a uniform, or if you think of Maoist China, or you take your pick, then, then I think it does start to make sense because it's the articles of dress, the particular articles of dress that become treasonous. But if everyone is in a uniform, then you don't have to worry about that. So it's a kind of external, it's kind of dress transparency, you might say. And then becomes surveillance. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and, but then after, after the terror comes to an end with the, the, um, with the Mevayus and the Ankoyab and the sort of the, the costumes mm -hmm. that they wear as a sort of act of rebellion against, mm -hmm. against the sort of the, the terror and the sort of effort to homogenize and stuff. Uh, so, so that dress continues to be a political act in a very different way. Mm -hmm. right. So just an interesting footnote on David and to try to think about this chronology of theatricality and transparency. Um, before the revolution, this is about playing cards now. Before the revolution, the government had authorized the way face cards should look. Then the revolution comes along and you, could, you don't want kings or queens, so you design all sorts of alternative iconographies. Napoleon comes back to power. He wants to re-standardize the way face card look, cards look. Who does he commission? He commissions David to draw <laughs> up new face cards for the 12 face cards. David does this, and they are flatly rejected because they are too historicized and too uh, unfamiliar with the old patterns that had continued to be used throughout the revolution. So, and this is by, you know, the 18, it's 1811, 1813. Um, so the Davidian theatricality, at least in that context, doesn't work anymore by that point. <laughs> Ha, <laughs> <laughs>
Here's a quote. Hello, thank you so much. Um, my name is Mary Jo, and uh, I'm at the University of Chicago. And as a musicologist, uh, <laughs> I have to also kind of put in my uh, oral equivalent. And so I, I'm curious to hear, uh, we're such a visually based um, uh, we're such visually, visually based an analysts of, of theatricality, but I wanted to hear what you had to say about what oral culture could tell us about um, these topics. And I'm thinking in uh, parallel to David, uh, Mehul and Gosek, who were also able to change masks, uh, depending on you know who was in power, how they're able to also provide uh, elements of this theatricality all through uh, the different regimes. So. Well, I, I, I mean, I guess I'd say that um, that it's not transparency is not the right figure of speech, but sim, musical simplicity is the right figure of speech. And these composers, during the terror, um, eliminated all polyphony, polyphony, and uh, and and the harmony became much simplified, very very simplified. And some of the great spectacles where they would have thousands of people. And, and one would sing a C, and then the major tri third would come on an E, and then there would be a, tri a glorious triad with the G, and that would just be the best music <laughs> ever. So I think that's, that's probably the musical equivalent of what we're talking about, definitely. Um. Well, and I would say, and to add sort of performance to that, there's that the idea of, of sort of musical performativity, that there's a... That there's this sort of transparency associated with with singing and 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 musical performance that this is it's a it's a way of kind of it's a sentiment sort of leap leaping from heart to heart and that's a i mean that sort of brings us back to what I was talking about at the beginning of the conversation about performance and transparency that they're not mm -hmm. that that they're not necessarily in opposition to one another that there's a difference between the relationship between performance and transparency and spectacle and transparency. And another aspect which is not music, but an, I found an interesting tension between this question of whether you actually show or whether you just tell, whether it suffices mm -hmm. to have a narrative read at the same time in different places and that the words are sufficient and you don't need the, the physical display. Yes. My name's Tilly Boone Quier, and I'm at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, I just wanted to possibly bridge the last two questions and bring in a slightly aesthetic aspect here, uh, looking at some of the theorists who precede David and um, the communal song, uh, and just mentioned that in terms of theories of transparency right, uh, we s tend to associate them with Diderot and Rousseau's thinking about these topics in the visual and musical arts. And um, in thinking of David, right, uh, Michael Fried's analysis suggests that he very much grows out of Diderot's interest in genre painting, in the bourgeois drama, in some of these um, theatrical and visual modes uh, that are then put in the service of the state, right? Uh, they become ideologically charged when used uh, in the service of either revolution or empire. Um, same thing with the revolutionary festival, right? Very much and very purposely on Robespierre's part, right? Based on the notion of the outdoor festival, but when it's the army behind the young youths and maidens dressed up with flowers, right? Right. It's a very different sense of virtue, authenticity, and communal song. So I just wanted to add that presence of the, uh, you know, the, um, the use of the um, performance, right, and its authenticity with that slight menace of having put it in the service of the political ideology of the revolution and beyond. This isn't a direct response to what Tilly was saying, but it did make me think that a term maybe that hasn't been in our conversation so far that could be juxtaposed with theatricality is spontaneity. Mm -hmm. And spontaneity is something that one is always in search of, and the harder you try to find it, the further, the more it eludes you, the further away it moves. And I think that maybe is part of uh, at least a revolutionary dynamic, or certainly a Rousseauian dynamic around 
transparency around uh, onetete. Well, no, not, I mean not around that term in the old regime sense, but around uh, uh, transparent self-presentation. I'm not sure you're always in search of it, though. I think sometimes you're uh, desperately afraid of that, you know, the spontaneity and um, the part of people who might threaten you or, or who you can't predict what they're going to do, and, and that could be dangerous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've always, I've always found, uh, <laughs> this is one of the most stylized things in the entire world, a session, and, but it's not stylized around uh, uh, transparency or falsehood, it's, trans it's stylized around competency and capability and brilliance, and I think they've done it. Congratulations. <laughs>